the Parliament Channel 11. Also broadcasting on 105.5. As we resume, I recognize the member for Laventil West. You have an additional 17 minutes of your initial speaking time, so you can proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So, Deputy Speaker, I must. I feel obliged to address a matter raised by the member for Oropuchis. The member for Oropuchis told us, in the course of his contribution, that the government, the new government, the PNM government, fired eight senior managers from the HDC when we went into office. But I just want to remind them, the records will show they fired 5,000 persons, including from national security, Peter Joseph, which cost them about $2 million in settlement, mm -hmm. and Nigel Clement, which cost them over a $1 million in settlement. Mm -hmm. Very, very quietly. That is their record. And talking about hiring and firing, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we, Trinidad and Tobago, are represented at the United Nations with a permanent mission in New York. Mm -hmm. And there they have a small team of workers, mm -hmm. and those workers are home-based. That is to say, they are employed from Trinidad and Tobago and posted there. That is how it has always been. It's such a small unit, they are called upon to multitask, and they have been doing so painstakingly over many years. But by Cabinet Minute number 1429 of June 2011, when the member for Orupuch was a member of the cabinet and the member for Separia led it, that cabinet agreed to extend a contract position for three years in that mission for the position of executive assistant. And that was done on June the 9th, 2011. And by July the 29th, they hired a certain Patricia Munilal. Ooh. Any relation? I have to know. I want to ask the member for Orupuch whether he knows. Who is Patricia Munilal? She lived in New York, so her appointment was very unusual because, as I said, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they were largely home-based. And according to a letter written by the then High Commissioner to the Permanent Secretary, she was hired on the basis of her qualification and the interview. Let me tell you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what was her qualification. In 1972, she acquired a certificate from Trinzuela Secretarial College. Oh, very good. South Carolina West. And in 1992, 20 years later, she got a certificate of participation in August of 1992 from the Career Blazers Learning Center in New York. This is the first time I would have heard of that institution. And that was the extent of her qualification. She was practiced as a secretary, and that was it. Reshmi all over again. And she was hired. Mr. Deputy Speaker, she applied for the job on the 25th of July, 2011. She was interviewed on the 28th of July, three days later. And on the 29th of July, she received a letter from the then United Nations Ambassador, the member for Naparima, 
telling her that she was successful to get the job all in a matter of three days. What? It is not strange that the documents show that it was a concoction of sorts just to create a position and the cabinet was used in order to do that. So she was hired on the 29th of July. Deputy she... Speaker 48-1, trying to understand we, we are on a housing motion. <clears throat> and you see, she was not entitled to any housing benefit. <laughs> Overruled, proceed. So they ramped up her salary and from secretarial position like Reshmi, she wound up getting the highest salary in the mission and that caused all manner of upset among the staff. Yes. 4,500 US dollars a month. Wow, nice man. Broke all the rules, and then the member for Oropuch coming to tell us about hiring and firing here today. And Mr. Speaker, so the records show, Mr. Deputy Speaker, she got 30% more salary than anyone else coming from where she came, like Rishbi. She had less qualification than people who were there for Deputy years with Speaker. master's degree. Remember, again, tighten and let's you. move Thank on. You to speakers, right? Thank you very I'll much. Thank you I'll give you certain leeway. Tighten and come back to the. Most certainly. Well, the member for Oropuch was the minister of housing at the time. And what is remarkable when this happened, finally, Mr. Deputy Speaker, finally, in September 2011, Cabinet rearranged the position so as to move it from being home-based to locally-based in order to accommodate her because she was living there. And finally, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what is noteworthy, and the member for Oropuch must stand up here and give way to tell me when all of that was happening and he became aware that they were hiring Patricia Munilal, he never recused himself from the cabinet in Deputy those Speaker. discussions. What? Thank you're, you very you're much. You're tiny now. I I'm appreciate. tiny All right. She was not entitled to a housing benefit. <laughs> Nor even housing in our housing program in Trinidad because she was living in the United <laughs> States. <laughs> so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, when I have to now ask my friend Oropuch and my friends on the other side as I move on, and I want to ask more seriously the people of this country, is that what you want for governance in Trinidad and Tobago? Or do you not prefer the stern, stable, serious, honest government of the People's National Movement? I have told you of our housing record. I could have gone through all of the housing developments from River Estate in the West right on up all over this country. Type everywhere. And last week, I attended a funeral service, and I must pay compliments or respectful tribute to her, and may her soul rest in peace. A woman police officer, she retired as an inspector. She's related to the, the member for Tobago um, East. Former Inspector Roy, I attended the funeral service. And I took note, she lived in an HDC block of flats, perhaps no more than six apartments. Wherever we could find a footprint, we occupied it in the very and the most urban areas, and we put structures up to create housing units for people. That's why today the figure is about 55,000 in this country. And as I told you earlier, they were have distributed about 1,900 of those. So our record is strong. So I take serious affront to the member for Oropuch East coming here to challenge my colleague for San Fernando East for his very sterling management of the Ministry of Housing since we went to Denmark. Following PNM policy. Well done, and therefore the behavior of the well UNC in government and the behavior of those who led the housing ministry, whether it is to involve criminals to get contracts here and there, as we heard earlier today, that is to be rejected. We are the PNM, and we do it very, very, very differently. So I, I would like to, I, I, my friend was speaking today about reporting matters to the Integrity Commission. I am going to look further into this question of the failure of the member for Oropuch East to have declared an interest in a matter that came up in the cabinet, and in a matter that I consider to be quite improper. It caused no end of upset in the United Nations office in Trinidad. And we will take a, a look on that. So Mr. Deputy Speaker, yes, but that is the way you all do business. 
and then come in here to play Sam Simonius first. Address the chair, Thank please. Thank you very much. The member for San Fernando East reminded us that it took a PNM government since we are here for the past two years without any allegation of personal benefit being sought for anybody on this side. Two years. By now in government, their rap sheet would have been as long as you could get it. <laughs> and I feel confident to say to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we will do the next three years just like this. Clean as a whistle. Good governance is all we offer the people of this country. <laughs> That is our record. They increase the ceiling of people who could access, whether it is a single income or joint income between husband and wife or partner or brother or sister or whatever. They increased it from 25,000 to 45,000, allowing bigger fish to come into a small pond. This housing program was built on a philosophy to deal with the less able in the society. So now my friend from San Fernando East can truthfully tell us you could go through the average housing development and you're seeing Mercedes, Benz, and Prado and all kinds of things. Persons who would not ordinarily have qualified for a subsidized house. Houses that are subsidized to the extent of 50 and 60%, they allowed big sharks to come into the small pond to the detriment of the people. And it is our duty to let the people understand that. So they will know where Bali and Balize grow. And they will know what is best for them. And we have no fear of the next three years. We have no fear of the next election. Because all we concentrate on is serving the people in the most difficult times. And that is what we are doing. And we are confident, as Bob Marley would have said, we know we shall win. Because good will prevail over evil every time. And none of my colleagues here don't have to worry about any air-conditioned room anywhere. And any KY formula. <laughs> and any no such issues. Madam, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the housing program, as I understand it, caters for different categories of people. <laughs> different categories of people. You have an emergency element. And I have recommended persons who found themselves in emergencies. They can go, and once they can demonstrate to the, once they can demonstrate to the authorities at the Ministry of Housing, that they have a genuine emergency, I have had people benefit from housing in those circumstances. That's a song policy. As a matter of fact, yes, you didn't help me. When I, as member of parliament, I wrote a letter on behalf of a constituent, several letters as a matter of fact, on behalf of constituents who would have benefited in that regard. Once they could demonstrate it was an emergency. And that is what the program is, nothing personal. And then, of course, you have a category for the disabled and elderly citizens. Again, the weaker in our society. And having said that, I want to place on record for the members' benefit. Because you would have heard my friend from San Fernando East demonstrate how they squandered and wasted and... Plundered. Plundered? All kinds of millions of dollars in that $8 billion housing program. And we did far more with far less. And we'll do it again. We don't, squeeze, we don't waste the country's money. And on that point, I want to take note of the fact, and I want the citizens to recognize, notwithstanding the difficulty that we now face, the first priority in government's recurrent expenditure every month are the elderly and the disabled. Social security benefits are paid first. Old age pensions, guaranteed. Salaries, we struggle to do it, but we are doing it. That's how we do the business. Another element in the, is for national security. There was a philosophy that in every housing development, you allow some uniform personnel, fire officers, prison officers, soldiers, coast guards, men and women, police officers, a small percentage take residence in those blocks, obviously for the purpose of being good and upstanding examples. And obviously, as well, to bring some palliative, bring some balance, bring some resolution of issues when they arise in such communities. Today, unfortunately, I am getting a significant amount of calls and, and visits 
from uniform personnel who want to get out of certain communities because of the change in social circumstances. I don't always subscribe to it because we can't be running, running, running. We have to stand up and deal with the issues. I met many uniformed personnel They want to come out of this area and come out of that. And while I understand their personal circumstances, I understand as well the general philosophy, the wisdom of it, and I hope we can return to those days. We also have the mm. modified random selection. Because, I mean, a pure random selection will be a bit of a problem because if a man is living in Faisabad and he is one of the earlier, well, if you do it on the basis of first in, first out, or the older applicants getting houses first, it wouldn't always work so neatly. So we have a modified random system where numbers are, well, persons are chosen and they are given access to these units as well. You have the rent to own, you have mortgages, you have 2% interest in some cases when you go to TTMF and 5% at its highest. All soft loans so that people in a viable housing policy according to the motion so that people who are deserving can access them. We have done everything to make it possible for persons to access it. And just as the UNC worked hard to ensure that the big fishes got into the small pond, we have been working assiduously to make sure there's a small fish business and the people's needs are going to be met. I want to tell you sadly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, about a case with which I have personal knowledge when the member for Urupuch East was the Minister of Housing. And I will not call the name of the citizen, but I will identify that citizen by the initials KP and no more, because these are facts. One day sitting in my office, my secretary told me that a couple was outside to see me. A young man, public servant, and his recently estranged wife. They had separated, but she had gone to him and they both came to me to tell me that she went to a certain minister of government. And if they only prompt me, I call his name here today. The man is now a chairman of a corporation. The woman told me she went in the presence of her husband. I'm only repeating because we're dealing with housing policy and the way we do it as opposed to the way they did it. She went to him with some problems, including the need for a house. And he listened to her pain, and then got up from his cushy chair and walked towards her, and put his hands intimately on her body and began to touch, and to show her the minister would help. Member, I, I'm on my legs. Member, I'm on my legs. I am on my legs. I was on my legs before you rose, sir. Member. Member for Laventil West. I'm not directly on what line you are going down to, but I'll prompt you at this time to desist or caution you from going to the extremity of what you're probably coming at. I'm most Just grateful in case. and I do understand, Mr. Speaker. I'm most grateful and I understand. But I just wanted to I just wanted to deal with this question of housing allocations and housing policy. And the motion says, let me remind us of the motion, you know. The member filed a motion saying, be it resolved that the House take note of the continuing failure of the government to implement a viable housing policy to provide affordable housing units to qualified and deserving citizens. I'm responding to this. So I was just really re 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 relating a real live example of a deserving citizen who found herself concocted. You know, you know, God is my witness. Yes, and Mr. Deputy Speaker, so this thing went. And the next thing you know, I called a senior attorney and told the attorney what was happening. And I said, you are female. I want you to interview and talk to the young lady so no one could say that there was any political interference. The next thing you know, I received a call that the following morning at around quarter to 6 AM, that former minister made contact with the lady all night calling because he must have found out she was talking to someone. 
30 minutes has expired. You care to avail yourself of the additional Most 15? Certainly. Proceed. Most certainly. And according to the husband, all right, but let me come to it. Let me come to it. Let me come to it. Eventually, offers and approaches were made to the young lady. And under, I, I don't know what it was, because I myself felt disappointed. She was issued a house in Oropun, Trinidad and Tobago. She was issued a house in Oropun, Trinidad and Tobago. And I have the address, if my friend wants to have it. As a part of a price to discontinue certain discussions with the senior counsel and I. And her husband in pain told me that is what happened there. She is now in occupation of the house. I want to know if the member for which is is prepared to deal with that. Mr. Deputy Speaker, a word to the wisest official. I consider this motion to be... Uh, member, Lavendel West, member for Karani East, and member for Toko Sandy, member for Toko Sandy Grandi, and member for Karani East. If you care, you all can exit the chamber and have your discussion. But I'm not going to tolerate any members, member for Shogunas West, Kuva South. Karani East. Take a little walk for me, please. Take a walk. Member for St. Jude. Members, I am on my legs. And if this is the sign that we have to reach to, I am not tolerating the excessive cross talk across the chamber, members. And added to that, I'm on my legs, and members still want to make comments. So proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for your intonation to my errant colleagues on the other side. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was coming to my own conclusion. And I was simply putting these facts to the people of Trinidad and Tobago as it relates to our housing policy. I consider this motion to be vexatious. I consider it to be a concoction that was supposed to be the staging post for certain bombs today. But of course, as I indicated, there were none. There could be none. And we heard today in the presentation by the member for Orapuch, personal considerations. It is what I call an ad hominem motion. Mm -hmm. It was done for a singular purpose for the benefit of the singular member. That's why I call it ad hominem. And I also put those simple, sordid facts so that the people of Trinidad and Tobago could, as they contemplate, those who look and listen to this debate, as they contemplate the issues in front of us, the cost of housing, the fact that there are 172,000 people on a waiting list, the fact that this government was bold enough, truthful enough to say openly, there is no way the government could meet in our housing program with the best intentions, the expectations, the desires, and even the needs of every one of those 172,000 people. And therefore, we are trying to find new ways, creative ways. One of the things we have done is to say, look, here, we have lands. We can make land available, Mr. Investor. You can come in with your capital, and we'll do a PPP, a partnership between the government and the private sector. And you develop the housing. We have the list of those with needs. We have the TTMF. We will make our list of persons who are ready to buy your units, so a market is not going to be your problem. You build them on lands we will fix and approve for you and you will have a ready place to sell them among our list using the very TTMF. A very creative solution. We tried it in Mount Hope, and it is happening. A little slowly, but it is happening. Creativity in difficult circumstances, because we know we can't, in the normal, traditional ways, meet all the needs of the people who want them. And most of all, we have cut out waste and theft and corruption. We have done that. 
at least to the level of the cabinet and the government. We've done that. That is the ethos. That's how we operate. It is taking a little time to seep right through the system, but we are confident within the next three years they will understand that perfectly. And the last reason why I put those sordid facts to the people is so that they will choose sensibly. They will know from the record that the member for San Fernando East demonstrated here, a proud housing record. They will know from the few facts and housing that I offered to them. They will know what is what. Who is who? Which is right and which is wrong? And they're sure that the member for San Fernando East will treat no woman, no citizen that way. So when the next time comes, whether it's in a local election, whether it's in a by-election, or whether it's in the next general election, when the time comes to choose, they will be well advised and they'll know whether they will choose Jesus Christ in metaphor or Barabbas. I thank you very warmly, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I recognize the member for Orupuchis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I begin, please, they are disturbing me. As I begin, Mr. Speaker, let me begin by thanking all Mr. Speaker, let me begin by thanking all members for contributing to the motion. And uh, I want to warmly congratulate the member for Lavantil West who um, contributed there. This, and the member for Diego Martin Nortis who contributed as well in his own way by talking rubbish across the floor. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they are disturbing me, please. Members, Whichever standing order deal with insulting no, the point, point. The please. point of order, member. Oh, insulting. Mr. Speaker, I withdraw that. Use a, use a different yeah, okay. word. Well, I, I withdraw it completely because there's no other word I could use. Um, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank colleagues for, I want to thank colleagues for contributing today. Um, I have heard, I have heard the presentation from the member for San Fernando East. And Mr. Speaker, having heard the presentation, I really today, sadly and regrettably and probably depressingly. There was a time when San Fernando East stood in this house and we were blessed by rhetoric and charisma and vision and flamboyance. And today, look what, the, look what this they gave us today from San Fernando East. May, may his soul rest in peace. He was my member of parliament as well and he was well missed. If today this is what San Fernando East is, we are really, we are straining, we are straining. But Mr. Speaker, that is my own emotional take, but um, the member made a few observations. Mr. Spe Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are two fundamental issues I dealt with earlier in the motion, two. I raised the matter of the allocation of a house, an apartment, an executive apartment. I called upon my friend from San Fernando East to please identify this person and give us your knowledge of the person. For 45 minutes, the member for San Fernando, he spoke. He spoke about every single thing imaginable, but at no time did the member want to go on record. Not to talk across the floor, not pecong, not old talk, but to go on record and say, I do not know this person. And there's a reason for that, Mr. <coughs> Deputy Speaker. It is not my job and I do not wish to embarrass the member for San Fernando East. All I will ask the member is in the appropriate forum of, with his government and his cabinet, he please indicate to his colleagues the nature of that relationship. That he has. I am not in the business of embarrassing people. I'm not in the business of embarrassing people. If it is, you see, he's prompting me to. Mr. Madam, Deputy Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker let me go on to the next. Please. What is that? Standing order 486. What is it? With regards exactly to what. Um, the minister was, uh, the member was saying that Minister. Randall Mitchell should tell the cabinet about some sort of relationship, sordid relationship. What does that have to do with this? As imputing improper motives. Meet 
think they protested too much. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for your wisdom. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will leave that matter there and move on. I will leave it there. I will leave it. It is not my intention to embarrass anybody. I'm not the member for San Fernando East. I see him as harmless, non-combative, and temporary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the other major point I made today is on the Price Waterhouse Cooper. Involvement in the government. I spoke about that involvement with some depth at HDC. I made reference to EFCL. Colleagues opposite made reference to the EMBDC. To this time, this debate is now coming to an end. Not one member of the government speaking in 90 minutes have sought to defend the government from the allegations that I have made. And that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, speaks volumes. That speaks volumes. It is deafening. I would have thought the first thing the government would want to do is rebut my allegations and accusations allegations? about, you, you see again, to go on record, because I'm speaking on record. I'm not speaking in Pekong. I am not speaking, I'm not in the bar here. I am at the parliament speaking for the public record. I made serious allegations against PricewaterhouseCoopers. I made serious allegations about uh, involving a government minister. Yeah. I would have thought that the relevant government minister from Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, would have rose and, and, and defended his good name and tell us, no, it's not him. Or if he did that, I didn't do that knowingly. I understand the law. The member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, is a lawyer, an attorney at law. And if he could not rise in this house and clear his own role on the public record, on the public record, could not explain those circumstances, Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that also speaks volumes. It speaks volumes. And I am in shock and awe that those two main issues I raised were left unanswered by the government. So the public record in this matter will close, and those two issues are left on the public record. Let me repeat the two issues, because members are asking what are the two issues. So let me repeat it. The minister from San Fernando East, knowledge of someone who has received an apartment through a mortgage arrangement for $4 million from the EHDC. They sold it. I don't know. We could find out. All I'm asking, look, the member for San Fernando West asked me about my family member. I'm going to re reply to that now. <laughs> my friend from San Fernando West, I'm not going to engage him directly because he's really going to try to confuse me and to confuse the parliament and so on. Yes. Madam Speaker, on the matter of the house at Victoria Keys, I raised it earlier in my presentation, $4 million. The member for San Fernando East ought to tell us his relationship to the person who obtained that. On the matter of the Price Waterhouse Coopers, the government for 90 minutes could not stand up and defend their actions in Price Waterhouse Coopers coming into HDC illegally. I have said it before, and I'm winding up now. I was waiting on their defense. I was waiting to tell us how, it, how PwC can come illegally and take government property illegally, cart it away when there's no contract in place with the board of directors of the HDC. And the PwC continued this process by writing the TTMF, as I said before. No minister of government stood and confronted that issue and tell me I am wrong. Or in law, they ought to have done this, or they ought to have done that. Madam Speaker, no one rose and told me that I got it wrong, that the TTMF letter was proper. And you know, in a strange way, Madam Speaker, 
I don't know, they may have had an explanation. I was waiting for it. In the absence of an explanation, because that is what we do in a debate, one side will make some points, the other side will rebut. In the absence of an explanation, we will have to stand our ground by indicating that Price Waterhouse Coopers acted improperly at best, if not illegally, in approaching the TTMF. And that matter is there. Madam Speaker, the member for um, San Fernando East took his good time to reply to me and raise several matters that I'd like to respond in winding up the debate. The, the member was concerned, of course, with housing costs and argued, as he will argue from now until eternity, about costs of housing under UNC and PNM. That is such a sterile debate to enter into. Statistics, because everyone can marshal statistics. You know, you can actually use statistics to tell the truth. You can use statistics to say anything you want. So persons can come and say, under the PNM, it was $2. Under the UNC, $6. Under the UNC, $10. Under the PNM, that dollars. And I am not going to get into a fight like that. I am not going to get into a fight like that. What the minister will not tell you is that when you quote price in 2002 and price in 2010, there are different prices. The member for Diego Martin, Northeast, was the minister of works in this country when a bridge collapsed in Karani, somebody remember somebody died there. And I remember debate in the parliament when the members, Minister of Works, led an argument when we raised the issue of price and, and escalation and variation and cost. And the member for Diego Martin, Northeast, argued vehemently that we were talking, what we were talking was not proper sense because we are comparing prices in 2008 and 9 with prices in 2001 and 2000. He carried that argument. But today, we all have to hear the member for San Fernando East talk at length about the cost then, the cost now, the cost there, as if that changed anything. You know, the, as if that will make some difference. Talk about Victoria Keys. That was a big preoccupation of the member as well. Victoria Keys. And Victoria Keys, Madam Speaker, I have a bundle here that I would never have had time to go through. But we have the bundle on it here. And the member, I just want to inform him that this matter of Victoria Keys started in 2005. In 2005, the original building works design concept was more or less $119 million. At the HDC, we could not find a contract agreement. We could not find the date of that contract, and we could not identify who are the parties legally to such a contract. But work started, work was done. There's also a figure here for Victoria Keys, additional flow and other variations, $153 million. At the HDC, at the HDC, and I'm reading from something here, a document of Tuesday, January 26, 2016. It's quite um, relevant at this time and day. At the HDC, we could not find, or they could not find now, a contract agreement with whom and by whom. So the point I'm making, Madam Speaker, Governor. is that 119 plus 153 million dollars spent. That's about 260 million, more or less. And at the HDC, as of January 26, 2016, this is when you are in office, you could not find any documents from 2005 to tell you who are the contractors, what are the contract terms, nothing. And that was a hallmark of the old HDC. Bill everything, put up everything, no contract in place, no board decision taken. But let's talk about escalation because I think the minister was very concerned with escalation. Escalation, $183 million more or less. Building completion works, redesign, and there's a breakdown for redesign, building completion works. This was a site, Madam Speaker, that they had to blow up a mountain, I think. They had to detonate dynamite to, at Powder Magazine to put it down. And we have building completion works, redesign, etc. But you know there's a board approval and board note, 6 March 2012. 
So the matter went to the board on the 6th of March 2012, where a decision was taken to spend $183 million. But no board note could be found for $260 million before us. You have another note here from the board, 31st August 2014, external infrastructure, recreational facilities, car park, works, and so on. And guess what? 30th August, um, there's a note here, contract agreement date. And this was done by the board. So when we got involved in this, we have board approvals to do everything. To do everything. But Madam Speaker, at, at Victoria Keys, the minister would have us believe that we would have a nine-story building without an elevator. So what you were expecting, persons there to carry a fridge on their back nine floors up the hill? To carry up a stove? <coughs> or the car park? So you, you didn't want a car park? So you, you have a car park with elevator. And how are they going in the house with the fridge? Madam Speaker. So Madam Speaker. No, they put in the fridge in the car to go in the car park. That's what your colleague is saying. Madam Speaker, we are talking about, uh, you see, they, they, they can't talk when they have to talk, but they disturb when we have to, to talk, you know. Madam Speaker, under our government, we put in external infrastructure in place, recreational car park works, and it was properly approved by the board. So when the minister says he doesn't know about cost escalation, when he says he doesn't know about cost escalation, you ought to know there are board minutes that tell you this. Look at all the board minutes here. I can show you it. I can't show you it, but all the board minutes here, you could find out and read yourself and find out what led to cost escalations. At that place, I remember there was no garbage chute. So when you put out your garbage by your door, you had to walk down nine flights and carry the garbage down. And when you are going down, you will be hitting people's door in the corridor, throwing down garbage as you go down nine floors. That is what we met. In the HDC communities, we were also wanting to build facilities like recreation grounds, put things for children. Beverly Hills, there's a Beverly Hills HDC. You know it? I think you know it. We put a playground there for the children. Do you know that Beverly Hills facility has solar lighting? Because we, we thought that if we put normal lighting, given the nature of, the, of that community, it may be vandalized and so on. We put solar lighting because we said the sun, the sun could keep the energy. We open a solar lit park for children in Beverly Hills. And that was part of our vision. So don't, don't be upset that we spent money on recreation facilities, on cultural facilities, on, on car park, and that type of thing. So that, it explains itself. Madam Speaker, on the price water of Cooper's matter, the government did not respond, and I'm saddened by that because I thought there ought to have been a response. <laughs> Madam Speaker, but what gets it more worrying now is a matter I want to raise. In addition to that, PwC went in and, con and sought to conduct an audit. The member for Port of Spain North, who is now telling us he's going to deal with WASA, he had his hand in PTSE, he had his hand in EMBDC, he had his hand in HDC, and so on, and that is fine. That's a matter we'll take up somewhere else. But PwC went in to do audits. And then you know what is the end result? The PPP program in, instituted by HDC, guess who is the project manager for that program? PricewaterhouseCoopers. So you go in as an auditor and you come out as a contractor. So they, are doing, they, are, they have a contract of service while they're auditing. They could be effectively auditing themselves. They could be effectively auditing themselves. You go in as an auditor and you come out as a contractor. And to this day, we had to learn in the newspaper that PricewaterhouseCoopers is the project manager of the PPP. What experience do they bring to managing these programs? No wonder that is in a state of pre-collapse. NH International and HDC, I don't know if it's over, they go Martin Nortis and the money he has for him, but they are now in a state of pre-collapse because what you have done is you have infested the PPP from the beginning. You have infested it. Once you do that, you infest it. So PricewaterhouseCoopers conducting audit, in touch with government minister, in touch with chairman, conducting the business, and then suddenly they pick up a contract while they're inside here. 
I want to ask the minister for San Fernando East. He will answer. He could do a press release. Or something. Was there a competitive tendering to get the project manager for the private-public partnership projects? Was that done by competitive tendering? Or did you sole select PwC because they were working before on audits and investigating and running down and sharing information about former government ministers and the administration before? So they got an end. They got a big end, but they got an end. They come in and they are now working for the HDC. <laughs> you see, Madam Speaker, I know you were not always in the House, but you diligently follow the proceedings. During their contributions, and particularly Lavantil West, you know, it takes a PNM government to put a, a PNM civil case in court and talk about jail. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it takes them, because right through, you know, this is who going to jail, who not going to jail, who doing this, who doing that, and they are preoccupied with that. And I want to tell them there's an old saying, when you dig grave for others, you will fall in it. So be careful. So be careful. Be careful, Lavantil West, with your shovel. So, Madam Speaker, Lavantil West also took this opportunity to, without skill, work into the debate a matter concerning my personal, my family. But my family member, who he, whose name was called by the member and who continued to give us some information about, there was a councillor in San Fernando named Duncan, and he was a PNM councillor. And when he fell out with the PNM, he told me one day, he said, I want to tell you something. You see, with the PNM, they will victimize your dog. Yeah, Barry Garcia says so too. Barry Garcia, who is that? Yeah. Uh, so, Madam Speaker, I am not surprised that they will come in Parliament with the name of my sister. She works in New York with the UN mission. <laughs> And they will bring her name here and raise matters of her business. So I am not surprised at all. 20 years ago, maybe I would have reacted differently. But I will not react differently, except to say, Madam Speaker, that to my knowledge, in the partnership cabinet, we had several lawyers and several outstanding lawyers. And I have no recollection of her name coming into the cabinet for any discussion. I have a recollection of positions being the subject of a cabinet note. But I want to assure you, if any member of my family, particularly close family like this, name was on a cabinet note, a few things in the world you're sure about, Rudolf Munilal will excuse himself. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I was leader of government business for five years. In the cabinet, I mean, I can say this without feeling bad. Without hesitation, Madam Speaker, it was my job as part of the little cabinet that, that to pick up that when we have notes involving people, ministers and their family or anybody who may be related for a thing, I would speak and I would say, Minister, notice this and that and we have to ensure that it's done properly. You cannot be participating and so on. So if it was my, if I took that as a responsibility in some way, you think I will sit down in a cabinet decision, see somebody named Munilal on a cabinet note, and sit down and participate in that? Yes. Lavantil West, do you think I'm you? Yes. You think I'm you? And, and no, I can't be you, I was trim. Madam Speaker, yes, thank you. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, so I want to assure Lavantil West, who raised the matter, and the House, and the country, that at all times in cabinet, we would act properly. We would act properly. And I ask him, if he has raised this matter today, I now challenge the member for Lavantil West. Although being a junior minister, I understand he has cabinet rank. He's a junior minister with cabinet rank. I challenge the member for Lavantil West to produce the note that bear my sister's name and any evidence he may have from the cabinet secretary okay. that I was in the meeting at that time. Okay. I, I just ask. I am, that's all I say, because I know the person I'm dealing with, Lavantil West. I, a year and a half ago, I gave him some advice. I made three editorial that time. I gave him some advice. I think I made about five calypso. Yeah. That advice stands. Yes. Yes. That yes. advice stands. I think it is more valid today than it was then. Yeah. You know? Um, Madam Speaker, that, that stands. So... They will choose to take steps. I understand um, the cabinet has already passed a note to deal with my family members and so on, and that's fine. 
It is one thing when you're in government, you will, you will do. So they, as I said, the dog they will victimize, yes. the dog. So that is nothing. We expect that. In fact, we don't expect less than that. So they can do that. God is great, and time is longer than W. Omira and twine. So we will understand when the time comes around, Madam Speaker. We will understand, but you can't understand that because you have school even, <laughs> Madam Speaker. Today when they talk and they all give their view and talk about jail and who doing the jail, and I like to hear this talk because it tells me something about the mind. They, they have confused and they have deliberately fragmented the separation of power issue. Yeah. That there's a court. I challenge members opposite to, 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 to serve documents. They did serve. Regrettably, Neither San Fernando West or Porter Spain not put their name on the court doc document. When I was waiting for them, they hide the duck and run. They put, they put a small co insolvent company that can't pay me damages. They put the company in front and they take off and hide in the back. You see, Madam Speaker, when we were growing up, we had a dog named Rover. And Rover used to go by the gate and bark. And from the time you open the gate, you run in the back and you hide. This is Rover we're dealing with. Rover 1 and Rover 2, Madam Speaker. So they're barking, but when the time comes, they run in the back of the house and hide. They could not put their name. If you want to sue a former minister, be brave enough. So the Attorney General taking action, man, is a former minister. They put an insolvent company that can't pay damages. But Madam Speaker, they raised the matter today. That is what they come here to do. That is what they come to, to talk about that. And the member for, for Lavantil West, um, he was, you know, he was halfway kind because he can't be completely kind. Um, when he acknowledged that he came to me with housing, a housing concern, and I was able to assist him. Um, and I, I was able to assist him. He brought a housing concern to me. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker I'm not giving away. If he has a standing order, he must say it. Madam standing order, the member is but, but he's <laughs> Madam Speaker, I just want to make it clear. What's he helped me with no Mem house. Member, <laughs> member I, you can only rise on a standing order if the member gives me. So, continue. Madam Speaker, 48-6. Member is stating on untruth. No, no. That, and an that, that cannot be done that way. Please, member, for love. I'm obliged. Tell us. Okay, please continue, Member Thank you Gucci. very much. Uh, Madam Speaker, so he admitted today I was able to assist him. And, well, nobody came for assistance. You came. But he came. The constituent never came. He came. He came to see me. He was waiting for me in our office for two hours. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, uh, Madam Speaker can I proceed, please? Uh, but, my, um, uh, member, I down. want to proceed. Member, I overrule. Yes. Member for I've never been to that office. I wrote a letter as member. Member, please. <laughs> <laughs> member for all <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, so, so Madam Speaker, the Price Waterhouse Coopers work at the HDC is corrupted, polluted, infested. We would be calling for an investigation subsequently. Huh? We would be calling for an investigation subsequently into the conduct of this PPP matter involving the, the same auditors that were used for other political purposes. And that matter, the government will be well advised to prepare themselves for. Madam Speaker, the member for San Fernando, he spoke about random selection and so on. And to this day, the member for San Fernando East has not indicated to us whether the HDC under his tenure has engaged in one random draw of a lottery for persons to get an equal opportunity to get a home. We had two big ones. They had none in two and a half, in two years or so, they had none. And you see, this is why their prime minister speaking to them the other day had to buff them as well, because they are not performing as a government should. The member for San Fernando, he stood 45 minutes, could not tell us what is his policy projections. The minister from Diego Martin Northeast, in his budget, as convoluted and, and thing as it was, and as paradigm crazy shifts. as it was, is a paradigm. Well, it's more, that, I thought that was more of a paradigm shift. <laughs> Madam Speaker, 
the, you would think that today is a golden opportunity for the minister to come and say, these are the details of our policy as announced in the, in the budget, and this is what we intend to do. He couldn't say that. They talk about EMBDC, and they will continue with that because they have a fascination. You know, their problem is they can't believe that we did so much without crookedness and corruption. They can't believe it. They just accuse me of all kind of wrongdoing. You know, look at them. I mean, and, and it is just bewildering, but Madam Speaker, I am sure that Senior Counsel Anna and Rob Ram Logan will deal with them in the courthouse at the appropriate time. So, and, and they will deal with them there. I don't want to get too much into that. Madam Speaker, there's a looming crisis in the housing sector, and it's coming soon. It revolves around a report that was done by Lawrence Lewis and Associate Limited, 2015. Madam Speaker, there is a housing estate called Wellington and a professionally contracted review, technical review of this site has indicated, Madam Speaker, that this site should be demolished and all 200 residents should be relocated because it is a sitting time bomb. And Madam Speaker, in Debe, in my own constituency, we tried, we spent $20 million to save that estate with infrastructure work. Today, a report, a technical report, has now recommended, Madam Speaker, that, that they, I'm reading it today, a technical report has now recommended that the entire estate be demolished because of the construction problems that they have faced. It was, a, it was Madam Speaker, a report, a report and expert witness, witness statement and report, experimental housing units. It is, it is dated 2015, Madam Speaker. They would have had it in their possession. Huh? Number four, Fuchis, your original speaking time is now spent. You're entitled to 15 more minutes Thank if you, you wish to avail yourself. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, the, the report, and I have the report in my hand, Madam Speaker. The report was made available, and I, can, I don't want to go through in detail, but the report was made available to two ministers, Minister from Port of Spain South and Minister from San Fernando East. And, Madam Speaker, the, the conclusion of this report that I have in my hand here says, Madam Speaker, that the entire review has shown well, there's an omission of several things, poor infrastructure, poor this, poor that. I don't want to spend too much time in that. But the, the report has concluded that the option of the Housing Development Corporation is to completely demolish and rebuild the buildings on that site. This, Madam Speaker, is another $100 million estate. This is worse than Las Alturas. And there, you now have a technical report telling you to demolish the site. I speak now on behalf of my constituents, Madam Speaker, I speak on behalf of my constituents to ask the Minister of Housing to investigate this matter, take whatever steps, but please do not allow citizens of this country to be exposed to danger, to be exposed to risk by continuing to leave them there while the homes may collapse, given the, the gravity of this report, Madam Speaker, that has already gone to the, to the relevant people in the HDC. Madam Speaker, if they don't have a copy and they lost it, I can give them the copy. I can easily give them the copy of the report. This was a matter that we dealt with, Madam Speaker. We had to institute this. Um, the, arbitration the arbitration judgment came out and the, the arbitration judgment came out and as the Attorney General is well aware, $23 million, I think, was the negotiated um, payment. And Madam Speaker, it was very instructive that as soon as we left government, they settled the arbitration. You know, they settled it and agreed to a figure. They agreed to a figure. That's what they did. They went and agreed to 23 million. And I am putting it to you that you will pay Agostini your 23 million dollars before you pay any contractor for work. It's Agostini that built the Wellington Housing Estate. The sod was turned by one Dr. Keith Rowley, Minister of Housing. The sod was turned by Keith Rowley, Minister of Housing. Agostini, who had never until then been involved in the housing sector at that level, came to Bill House. This is what we have today. They came in 2004, 5. I was the MP then. I went, Mr. Rowley was there. We went, and I didn't turn sod, but I was there. And today, in 2017, I'm telling you that the entire estate they are recommending to be demolished. Now, what manner of madness is this one now? 
But what I, what I am concerned with, Madam Speaker, is the safety of my constituents. Yeah. I'm concerned with nothing. So, Madam Speaker, the member for Lavantil West, um, preoccupied as he always is with jail and courthouse and all these kind of things, handcuff, and handcuff and, and, and all these things. But that is his preoccupation, and uh, we, we don't have a problem specifically with that because that means he would have had nothing else to say. There's also a, another attack that was launched today. The member for San Fernando East started it, Lavantil West continue. When you drive into certain places, you see certain houses and cars, um, Benz and Rover and so on. I'm sure half the government has drive Benz and Rover, by the way. So you go there, so you are telegraphing to people. That's what they do. They telegraph to people. Look here. They have rich people here. Um, rich people, they have cars, they have house, they have money. You could go there and rob them. And government must be careful of that. It, member for San Fernando, the member for Port of Spain, North St. Anne's West, I have a record of his talking in, a, in what I think is a budget consultation in San Fernando. And the member for Port of Spain, North, telling his crowd, look, you could see who thief money, watch the size of their house. Yeah. Winding up, and I'm not going to let you um, go down that route. Okay, Please. sure. So, Madam Speaker, the government ought to be very um, careful of their Statement. utterance in these matters. Madam Speaker, the housing sector deserves another review. And the review, Madam Speaker, deals with the land issue. The minister was right that under former UNC administration, Mr. John Humphrey and others pioneered a land distribution program. But what is amazing is that John Humphrey pioneered a land distribution program. What is it? Madam Speaker, it's 6 p.m. Well, six. The business should end at six, I think. No. Please continue, Member for Oropich. It's unless you've finished your contribution. No, I haven't finished, Member. But the standing please orders continue. require us to finish at six. Member, please continue. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. The the matter I raise now is land. The matter I raise now is land. And why is it? that there's a database at the Ministry of Housing. There's a database there. When we advertise for the Land for the Landless program, within one week, we had 10,000 applicants. At the end of that process, we had 42,000 applicants for land at the end of that. What is to become of that database? What is to become of that database? And more than that, Madam Speaker, we had two random draws televised nationally involving professional auditing companies. I don't know if it was Price Waterhouse or either, but professional auditing companies. We took two draws, 500 and 500, I believe. So you now have 1,000 persons, Madam Speaker, who have, who have indicated that they would like a lot of land, and they have indicated to you that they qualify. You know what is the response of the Minister of Housing? He says this system is corrupt. Yeah. Say why? He says, listen, some people selected, they don't even qualify. But they cannot qualify. When you are selected through a random draw, it is because you apply. It is now for the ministry to go and go through the applications. And who don't qualify, quite clearly, you cannot give them. But you will find people who are qualified. Remember, when you fill out a form and apply for a piece of land, you de deposit it. You get a receipt. We do a random draw based on that. We do a random draw based on that. So it has nothing to do with who qualified. The minister said they don't qualify. We find people who have house, and we find people who have um, property, and we find people who didn't qualify. You will find this is what the people apply. You will now have to cross-check if they are selected to go forward. The minister has to indicate to us, Madam Speaker, the minister has to, have to indicate to us, what are you going to do with the thousands of persons who have applied and with those who have been selected? And the minister is saying they will reapply. So 41,000 people, poor people, depressed people, underprivileged people, must now go and reapply for a lot of land. You understand what's happening here? By the time that application is received, by the time that application is dealt with, they are out of here. They are out of here. Nobody will have an opportunity to get a lot of land. Nobody. 
and you know, they, they stand here and talk about EMBDC. I want to put on the record, and I'm brave enough to do this. i brave. The EMBDC was one of the best managed companies in the government of Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, and you laugh because you haven't distributed a lot of land. Under the EMBDC, we distribute 5,000 lots. 5,000 lots distributed when we were there. The EMBDC prepared that. How much they prepare when you there? They don't prepare one lot because they prepare in case. They prepare in case to go for the PNM civil cases. And I don't fool yourself, this is not police and DPP, this is PNM civil cases. So the EMBDC spends all their time preparing case, but not preparing a lot of land, for which they are mandated to do. And I don't know where those cases they're preparing, they're preparing more. I don't know, maybe the Malcolm Jones formula might be used. <laughs> but, um, but I don't know what they're doing with that. They will waste judicial time, they will waste money, they will waste everything. But more important, I don't mind the personal persecution. That's nothing. I am dealing with that. I, I make for that. Okay. Have you delivered one lot of land in two years when we left developed sites there for you? Have in two years, not one citizen of this country has received a lot of land. And now you come to say that um, the site bad. But the site must be bad. Two years, you're doing nothing. They allowed, uh, my constituents came to see me uh, from an EMBDC area, it's called Picton, Madam Speaker. And the people are complaining there, the bush overrun the area, no street light. The road after two years, of course, of heavy rain and so on, is, is, is becoming eroded. They don't have any garbage collection service. And it is bandits in the area every night. The EMBDC cannot find, they don't have money to fix that. They don't but they have money to spend on their friends who are lawyers, and I will treat you that elsewhere. But they have money to spend on consultants from England. They spend US dollars for consultants from Canada, but they, they cannot pick up garbage in a community. You cannot cut the grass. You cannot fix the road. You cannot work with TNT to put lights. And people are being plundered and slaughtered in some of those sites. They talk so much about the MBDC. When you go in some of those areas today, any one of you know where Pitimon is? They don't. San Fernando, you know where is that? The people looking for you there. And when you go there, you will see houses built. Wait, you think it dropped from the sky? We gave the people a lot of land there. We gave lands that today you could see house built by former Karani workers on the land. You know, and you, and, and you sit there and do nothing. But you just stumble, but we file in case, we file in case. When you're at the Met office, I personally will prepare a suitcase with all that case and send you with it. <laughs> and you'll take that when you leave. And you the Met office. Wait. Madam Speaker, Wait. because, and that, that will be sooner than they think, Madam Speaker, because there is a fed upness throughout yeah. the country now. A fed upness. And Madam Speaker, uh, I, it is not my responsibility. It is not my responsibility to give advice for the member for San Fernando East. Quite frankly, I don't think he need advice. I think he's doing the best he can. But you need to implement now a much more innovative housing policy that targets building homes, but land distribution. That targets high rise, but yet communities for middle income people. They are against middle income people. Anybody in this country work hard and make money, this government is against them. They want to give them land, they want to give them house, and want to tax them. That is their approach. So, and, and then telling the criminals where to go and rob. So, Madam Speaker, it, the vision must be decent, affordable housing. The vision must be, because our land is limited, and the minister by now, after two years, he should know that 48% of the land mass of this country is forestry, <laughs> and so on, green, only 52%, more or less, we, we live on. And as you go along, you have to work with tongue and country planning, the Ministry of Planning, and so on. We had the plan. We had the plan that we will develop new towns, new villages, new cities. Today, you know, I'm almost tempted to ask the minister if he has taken an aerial tour of the HDC. But the ban from helicopter, I understand. You all can't use helicopter. Uh, but if you would have a, had the, the opportunity, like me, to take a chopper ride above Egypt in central Trinidad, you'll see a city. If you go above Pitimoon and look down, 
you will see a city, a town, with roundabout and houses and so on. These are how you, this is how you build. This is how you build and you develop. And you push your settlements more and more east because that's where naturally you will find land. And you create new communities, but create decent communities. My appeal to the minister, minister, I told you in the beginning you did not say no, so I assume I'm right, that the HDC staff in terms of their security department is depleted. For a long time now, the HDC, imagine the HDC that operates in crime zone, don't have a head of security. I met a gentleman once. I met a gentleman once in the lobby of the Hyatt. He came up, he shook my hand. I said, how are you? He said, good man. As he said, you don't recognize me. I said, no. He said, I'm the head of security of HDC. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I leave that job a long time ago. I said, who is the head now? He said, you don't know. When I checked with HDC, they don't have staff. How could you prevent Clifton Towers from happening again if you don't have staff? How could you prevent the invasion of property in Carson Field and elsewhere if you don't have staff? And security is critical to HDC, and I'll tell you why. Because your assets are houses, and many homes, as you know, will be shells in construction, so you have a roof and so on. But if you leave that unattended, it will be vandalized. It will be vandalized. People will go and not only live, but they will steal whatever you put there. And then you will pay more money. You will have to spend more money of the taxpayer. More you will have to spend in a condition where you say you don't have, you don't have more. You will have to spend more. And the problem now is that the communities for two years, when they were building case and chasing down Jolene John and other people and doing that, for two years they abandoned their primary responsibility, which was to safeguard the assets of the state. They abandoned that, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member for Oropuch East, your speaking time is now spent. Honorable Members, pursuant to Standing Order 46-2, a minister has the right to conclude the debate, so I now call upon the Minister of Finance. Didn't remember that, eh? Madam Speaker, I rise to conclude this debate, as you have indicated, pursuant to Standing Order 46-2 since this motion is critical of the government. Madam Speaker, in listening to the, the introduction of the member for Oropuch East and his winding up, I can summarize the contribution of the honorable member as follows. He made some nebulous, unsubstantiated allegations about the engagement of Pricewaterhouse to audit something at the HDC. But I am certain, Madam Speaker, I do not know what the member's intent was, but I am certain that that will be argued in another place. So I would not go into that matter now. I'm not certain what the honorable member was seeking to do, because I am certain that matter will be argued in another way, in another forum. The member also complained about a person who bought a unit at the Victoria Keys housing development on the open market and who financed the purchase by way of a mortgage loan. And as the Minister for Housing indicated, this mortgage loan would have been subject to the usual source of funds declaration. So mm -hmm. since the person, using the evidence presented to us by the member for Oropuchis, took out a loan from a financial institution, and all financial institutions in Trinidad and Tobago are required by law to have their customers engaging in these transactions indicate a source of funds and also satisfy the relevant officer at the bank to the integrity of the source of funds. Otherwise, a suspicious transaction report would be made to the Financial Intelligence Unit. The complaint of the member of the, about this person who bought a unit on the open market at the market price, using a loan which should have been scrutinized by a bank, 
the complaint was nonsensical. Absolutely. The honorable member also tried to justify the astronomical increase in cost of public housing units and service lots under his government, where the average cost rose from approximately $300,000 per housing unit to $1.2 million per housing unit in just a five-year period. And the honorable member sought to justify that 400% or fourfold increase in the average cost of a housing unit from the PNM era to the UNC era, costs went up four times on average. He sought to justify that by inflation. That too, in my humble view, Madam Speaker, was not a sensible argument. Because the inflation rate, the aggregate inflation rate over the period of the UNC, although they did superheat the price of things, the average inflation rate was not 400%. I don't think so. So that argument that the average cost of a housing unit on the PNM was 300,000 and escalated to 1.2 million under the UNC was as a result of inflation is without merit. The honorable member also made some other vague allegation about money laundering without a shred of evidence or even a single detail. We had no clue what he was talking about. And in defense of the terms of the law. The honorable member also failed to answer very serious allegations made by the Minister of Housing. And I would correct myself, not allegations. Failed to answer very serious facts put into the public record by the Minister of Housing with respect to the rationale of the former administration for making sole selective awards to housing contractors in the billions for housing contracts. He failed to even touch on that and rationalize that. But what I found particularly upsetting, Madam Speaker, was his last foray about a housing project in the Wellington yeah. area, is that where it is? Wellington DB. Wellington DB area? His own, his, his own area, his, his statements about some housing development by, um, constructed by a company called Agostini, and he read from some report, Lauriston Lewis report, mm -hmm. which according to him was another scandal similar to uh, that housing project on the, the Morva area, I can't, Las Alturas, yes. He said, this is bigger than Las Alturas, full of sound and fury. Well, Madam Speaker, he failed to tell us he that in December us. 2015, and I would think he skirted very close to a uh, breach of privilege, but that will be determined by others in another forum. He failed to tell us that in December 2015, in the matter of the Arbitration Act 1939, in the matter of an arbitration between Agostini's Limited and the Trinidad and Tobago Housing Development Corporation, where the arbitrators Three were very serious men, Mr. Peter Williams, CHB QC, Ms. Deborah Mastin, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, attorney at law, and Mr. Stuart Kennedy, FRICS, also a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, a chartered arbitrator and a barrister at law, were the three arbitrators. Uh, it's okay. I think he, I've read out enough qualifications for him. So the three arbitrators, the three arbitrators mm -hmm. rendered an award contrary to the allegations put into this house by the honorable member. It was not a settlement, it was an award by the three arbitrators where they awarded Agostini Limited the sum of $13 million in payments that were due to them by the HDC under the United National Congress government. And for the record, Madam Speaker, the hearings 
in that arbitration were concluded entirely within the period of the UNC government. The last hearing was on the 26th of May 2015, and the terms of reference for the arbitration were settled on the 20th of April 2014. So between 2014 and 2015, an arbitration took place while the UNC was in government. The hearings ended on the 26th of May 2015 while they were in government, and the judgment was given in December 2015 based on the evidence and the cross-examination and the submissions made by the UNC during their period. And on December, and in December 2015, the arbitrators awarded Agostini Limited the sum of $13 million. They dismissed the counterclaim of the UNC, which was made under the UNC when the honorable member was the minister. But what was most interesting is in that award, they made this comment in the claimant's closing submission. Reference is made to the evidence of the respondent's expert witness, Mr. Lewis of Lauriston Lewis. And they had this to say. We respectfully, we respectfully submit very little weight, if any, should be placed on Mr. Lewis' report <laughs> and his evidence. To put it in layman's language, the arbitrators rubbished the report. They made the point that of the 280 housing units, this is not my words, it should be noted that this project consisted of 280 housing units. While Mr. Lewis' report is silent on as to the number of houses he surveyed, he submitted in cross-examination that he took photographs of the houses he surveyed. We have been able to identify, based on the photographs, that Mr. Lewis only surveyed three units nah. out of 280, nah. one of which had been unoccupied, one of which was under repair, and one of which was occupied. And it is, f and it is for this reason, it is for this reason, and for the other reasons, the arbitral tribunal of three distinguished arbitrators and attorneys said we submit very little weight, if any, should be placed on Mr. Lewis' report. Yet the honorable member came in this house and said this is a scandal, and it is bigger than Las Alturas. But he didn't tell the parliament that under his administration, they were, they led evidence and got an, uh, an award against them saying that the contractor had to be paid for these houses, Madam Speaker. And I find this shameful that the so-called expert report that he, he, that he submitted was rubbish by the arbitral tribunal. They say well, they were not impressed. They could attach no weight to it. So, Madam Speaker, I am very, very dis disappointed in the submission by the mover of this motion. He, I thought, with all the tralala and the build-up to this, this motion today, I thought he was coming to drop bombs. My honorable colleague, the member for Laventil, said it was a damn squib. I beg to differ. He fired blanks. There was no gunpowder whatsoever. A cap's gun, as my honorable colleague in the back say. This was a waste of parliamentary time, Madam Completely. Speaker. And as I said, and I wish to repeat, it is just wrong for a member to come and read out a so-called expert report that was dismissed Rubbish. by a distinguished panel of arbitrators, dismissed by cross-examination and careful examination of that report. It was dismissed as rubbish. He and he hand. comes into this parliament and reads this report and drops this bomb as if it's something. It is reprehensible, it is wrong, it is just plain low. So, Madam Speaker, I reject this motion. Honorable members, the question is, be it resolved that this House take note of the continuing failure of the government to implement a viable housing policy to provide affordable housing units to qualified and deserving citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. All in favor say aye. 
Any against? Mrs. Robinson Regis? No. Mr. Alrawi? No. Mr. Imbud? I am afraid no. Mr. Young? Absolutely not. Mr. Dial Singh? No, waste of parliamentary time. Mr. Hines? Yet. <laughs> no. Mr. Mitchell? I'm doing a good job. No. Ms. Critchlow Kubud? No. Mr. Ford? No. Mr. Dillon? No. Mrs. Webster Roy? No. Dr. Gadsby Dolly? No. <laughs> Dr. Francis? No. Mrs. Jennings Smith? No. Miss Oliver? No. Mr. Antoine? No. Mr. Leons? No. Dr. Lee? Yes. Dr. Tiwari? Yes. <laughs> Order. Order. Dr. Khan? Yes, an excellent motion. <laughs> Mr. Singh? These are just us. Honorable members, the result of the division is four members voted for. <laughs> 17 voted against. So this motion has failed. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. I beg to move that this house to now adjourn to Friday, December 1st at 1.30 p.m. Madam Speaker, at that time we'll be continuing the debate on the mutual assistance bill that is before the house and debate started on November the 17th. Thank you very kindly. Honorable members, the matter filed by the member for Faisabad has been withdrawn. Therefore, there is one matter that qualifies to be raised on the motion for the adjournment of this house. I now call upon the member for Shogonas West. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have filed this motion entitled The Failure of the Government, in particular, the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government to solve the problem of flooding in the city of Port of Spain. Madam Speaker, when you peruse the newspapers over a three-month period, uh, let's say July 2nd, 2017, flash floods in Port of Spain, a street in Port of Spain. That, this is the uh, Trinidad Express newspapers. The brief showers flood Port of Spain, Trinidad Express newspapers of July 26, 2016. Pedestrians stranded as capital city underwater. August 6, 2016, Trinidad Express Newspapers. Trinidad Express Newspapers, published on August 11, 2016, 20 minutes of rainfall caused this. Gridlock out of Port of Spain, Trinidad Guardian Newspaper of 11, 27, 2017. Thunder showers accompanied by thunder and lightning caused people in Port of Spain to panic yesterday as the severe weather resulted in flash flooding throughout the capital. The November 25th, 2016, the Trinidad Express, will city floods ever be solved? 
the Trinidad Guardian newspaper, 11-37-2017, for the spring floods after 30 minutes of rain. Madam Speaker, the, I want to thank the Honorable Minister of Rural, uh, Local Government and Rural Development for being here. Our intention really is to address this issue of flooding in Port of Spain because when your capital city floods, it is emblematic of a certain approach and this problem to governance. And this problem has been existing in this country for several decades, Madam Speaker. I point to an IDB report, IDB report of 2013, Madam Speaker, done by DHI for the IDB at at, at, page, uh, at page one, Madam Speaker, in the introduction, it says, the overall purpose of the Port of Spain flood alleviation plan has been to develop new ways to eliminate the recurrent flooding which hampers Port of Spain frequently, one to several times during each rainy season. Although the flood events are of relative short duration of a few hours, each of them has big impacts on the infrastructure, on properties, traffics, and other infrastructure uh, components. The storm-related flooding is not a new phenomenon, but has been going on for decades. Due to the development of urbanization in the catchments of St. Anne's and Maraval River, the continued impermeabilization of the town area and functional deterioration of the old drainage system, the flooding events seem to have increased in frequency and combined with small changes in annual precipitation, the severity of the flooding has grown. Despite the increased frequency of flooding over the last two to three decades, nothing substantial has been done to minimize the flooding and the adverse effects. Madam, Madam Speaker, the, the, so that therefore you have a serious problem. And in, in the previous administration, for Spain, came out of the Emerging Cities, Sustainable Cities program. And out of that, through the efforts of the Minister of Planning and Development, then Dr. Botiwari, we, we, we acquired a loan of $120 million US dollars in order to deal with the question of flooding in Port of Spain. But that had its own challenges, and that is for another day. The reason why the Minister of Local Government and Rural Development is here, Madam, Madam Speaker. It is because we have to start with what can be done immediately within the presence of the Port of Spain catchment area in order to deal with the flooding that takes place so easily. So, Madam Speaker, we attempted to deal with that whilst we engage in the long term and short, the medium term planning to deal with the major infrastructure, drainage infrastructure that is required of Port of Spain. And the study has been done. And the study has recommendations. But Madam Speaker, what we did was we utilized the vacuum masters in order to clean the drainage within the area. And then we proceeded to put grates to block the garbage from going within the, the underground drainage. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, the reason why the Minister of Local Government is here, it is because the practice of garbage disposal on the streets of Port of Spain by the city council employees is to really use the, what is called the, the intakes and they push the garbage down the intakes. And as a result, you have flooding taking place because then the garbage goes into the lower reaches of Port of Spain in the South Key area. And that is why you have this slew of newspaper reports of flooding in the streets of Port of Spain. So the first thing that is required of the Honorable Minister is to really have a consultation with the mayor. I want to say, Madam Speaker, that I had approached Mayor Timkey, and he was very cooperative. He himself sent a reporter around to look at what was happening, and they recognized that the approach that they took, the sanitation workers took to the disposal of garbage created that problem further down the road. So, at the big, so in the beginning of the process, we have to vacuum out the, the underground drains because they lack the capacity. And then we have to be able to deal with a different measure, a different way to manage the disposal. And that therefore the city 
workers, city council workers, in dealing with that, has to have a new management regime as to how they deal with the garbage in, these, in the streets of Port of Spain. Madam Speaker, it is, this is no rocket science. The, the recommendations are there, the catchment areas are there, the need to build uh, Cuffer dams in the northern range, the, 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 they need to deal with expanding the drainage within Port of Spain, but they have to establish where the utility uh, lines are located, water, electricity, telephone, sewage, etc. Madam Speaker, the, the level of water because of climate change is increasing. You do not have enough permeation of water because there's a lot more concrete within the Port of Spain catchment area. And as a result, you have the problem th that is taking place. So I want to suggest to the Minister of Rural uh, 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 Development and Local Government that you have this discussion. Meet with the Mayor. <coughs> Mayor Martinez, I see, has indicated that Port of Spain Mayor IDB to work on flood plan of Monday 11 September 2017, the news day. So that therefore, there is an inclination in that direction and we cannot allow our capital city to be flooding all the time when there is very little rainfall. So I, this is a, a much more solution oriented approach. It is an approach that starts at the base and then we can, as, as funding becomes available, as it is available, through the IDB for this exercise, through the sus Emerging Sustainable Cities program, that we can then proceed with a view to getting this capital city of ours flood free in a, in a time period with, with, with conditions that will allow us to, to recognize that Port of Spain, if you stop the flooding in Port of Spain, then you will begin to approach the flooding in the rural communities and the rural centers differently. So, Honorable Speaker, to the Honorable Minister, step by step, a methodology can take place. There can be a program of works that will allow Port of Spain not to be flooded, or at least the runoff is quicker in the short term. And then, of course, you do the medium to long term plan, utilizing the IDB study, which is extensive and which has recommendations. So, with these few words, Madam Speaker, I Therefore, commend this IDB study to the minister, and to, I look forward to his action in this area to cure the flooding in Port of Spain. The Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Madam well, Speaker, thank you for having me here this afternoon. And after listening to the Honorable Member for Shogunas West, I was wondering if to respond or just take his advice and meet with the mayor to discuss the flooding in Port of Spain. So I will take the advice of the Honorable Minister. And it's well on the way. Thank you. Honorable members, honorable members, the question is that this house do now adjourn to the Friday, the 1st of December, 2017 at 1.30 p.m. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. This house now stands adjourned to Friday, 1st December, 2017 at 1.30 p.m.